Welcome. Um, we have a very uh, special and exciting uh, webinar for you today. We have uh, really one of, I find to be the most compelling and, and interesting estates in, in all of Germany. We have uh, Weingut Wittmann um, today. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar, but um, if you're not, I'll give you a real high level uh, overview. Um, Wittmann was established in 1663. Um, so that makes 15 generations of uh, wine growers um, at Wittmann, um, over 350 vintages um, that they've uh, conducted. As you probably know, they're in the Rheinhessen, they're in Westhofen, which is the, probably the best area of the Rheinhessen, rolling limestone hills. And, you know, Wittmann has really been uh, a pioneer um, in the area, one in organic uh, viticulture. They've been practicing organic viticulture for 30 years. They were certified first in 1990. Um, and then in 2004, um, they converted over to biodynamics. So they were certified then. Um, and then Philip Wittmann, whom we have here today, um, he was German winemaker of the year um, in 2014. So just a really interesting, uh, compelling uh, winery uh, estate that we want to share with you today. So we, today we have um, Matthias Mueller, who is the sales director. He's on your left. And then we have Philip Wittmann of Weingut Wittmann. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. hi. Thank you it's very a big much. pleasure. So I don't know, do you, I think, uh, did you want to start out with uh, maybe saying a couple words or did you want to just, I know that you have a video that you wanted to show as well. Yeah, it's for us. Thanks, thanks again for the opportunity of, of, of uh, giving us the chance of, of showing what we're doing here. Um, I think it's, it, would be, it would be a good start if we maybe show the video first to get that the people get an impression of, of what we're, how it looks like at the estate. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe we, should, we start with that. Perfect. All right, let's go. I think uh, this should give you an idea uh, how it's looking here. 
So um, maybe uh, we should start with uh, explaining a little bit where we are uh, situated in Germany, uh, what's uh, the specialty of the region, and then we go more into the details to the village and to the family. And so um, a little bit of uh, the idea how it's developed uh, that we are existing nowadays or still nowadays yeah. after this long time. That would be great. Perfect. So maybe we, we, we do have a little presentation and we could do it in the way that we show the presentation and explain uh, uh, also um, in this time. So let's... Uh, um, yeah, start at, at, at the, let's do a virtual tour and, and start uh, um, at the map of Germany where you uh, could see where Rheinhessen, the biggest German wine growing uh, region is placed, situated. It's southwestern part of Germany. So uh, we are 80 kilometers southwest of Frankfurt on the left bank of the River Rhine. And uh, this re the region uh, uh, do have uh, more than 25,000 hectares of vineyards. A big diversity, a lot of sub-regions, different soils, different climate conditions. Let's say comparable to Bordeaux in the differences, but of course smaller, just 25% of the size of Bordeaux. So, and we are situated in the south, southern part of this region. Um, in the village called Westhofen. It's close to the Pfalz region, you know, and this means our climate conditions are also more comparable uh, to Pfalz than to um, Rheingau, or Nahe or Mosel, which are far northern from us. And so this means we do have the big advantage for our doing that we do get ripe fruits year by year and not since yesterday, since a long time, so therefore the, the tradition of my region is producing dry wines in general, especially at our place here in Westhofen, where our village where, where uh, we come from. Yeah, it's um, a, a estate which is uh, family-based and with a long uh, history in the family. So we are here in Westhofen since 1663. This was the first written uh, um, date uh, where our name was placed for being wine grower here in this uh, uh, wonderful village. Westhofen is a village with has, uh, 750 hectares of vineyards, so a big size for a village, one of the most important wine villages um, of, of the region, um, based on, on very chalky soils, so clay, marl, limestone textured, really limestone rocks in the underground. And this gives a lot of uh, um, uh, unique characteristics to the wines. Um, our estate uh, is uh, a family estate, a, a kind of boutique winery from the size. It's just 30 hectares of vineyard. So we do produce around 250,000 bottles a year. Um, the main variety for sure is the Riesling. It's uh, more than 75% um, and followed by the different burgundy varieties. So the Pinot family, especially the, the Pinot Noir, but also the Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and also some Chardonnay is growing here. And then we have to some other varieties just as a playing ground. So, but the main focus is the story of the Riesling, I would say. Um, a unique thing or a special thing for us is also that we have been one of the earliest uh, organic uh, farmers here in Germany. So my parents started working organically in the 80s. We have been certified since uh, 1990 as organic uh, wine uh, estate. And uh, we moved to biodynamics in the 2000s and we do have the certification since 2004 for biodynamic farming and for us it was not a big step because of the, the this uh, basement of organic uh, growing but it was an important step because quality wise it was just the next possibility 
to work better and more intense in the vineyards. And at the end, all our doings are very much focused on the vineyard work to produce perfect fruits. And from this uh, point, we could just keep the quality into the bottle. And the main idea is producing wines which do reflect the origin in the best possible way. Yeah, a few pictures uh, um, of the estate. So um, it's, uh, yeah, that's my family. So my wife, Eva, which is uh, um, also a winemaker. She is owning her own estate at the Mosul Valley. Crazy, but it's existing like this because we have met us when we have studied uh, in Geisenheim, where all the German winemakers uh, have to study, I guess. Um, and uh, so we decided um, yeah, it would be unfair if one of us will lose this uh, idea following the family tradition. So she is running her own estate at Mosul, but we do live together here in Westhofen. And my parents are still helping uh, enormously here at the estate. I would say uh, my mother, uh, she is still the finance boss, so she's the real boss of the estate. You have to ask Matthias. Uh, and uh, my father, who is still very, very important for the vineyard work. He's a, win a kind of vineyard manager. Of course, we do talk a lot about doings, but he's helping me enormously uh, to having the overview and he's also in the wines day by day. This is a view um, to the building where we are situated at the moment. We are in the first floor here right now. It's a building where we do have the office and the tasting rooms. Philip, and, uh, can I just ask a quick, quick question? So sure. when, did you, when did you take over um, the reins sort of, sort of from your father? Uh, it's a long time ago. I do not remember anymore. <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I started uh, in 2000 um, after studying at the estate. And um, in the first time I was the junior uh, partner of my father in a way, but I do got the responsibility for the wine cellar in the, my first year. So the first vintage which uh, uh, I was responsible was uh, 1990, uh, 1999, 2000, something like this. And then it moved over the years in a way that it changed from being the junior part into the situation that uh, the father um, is, is, is getting the senior. So um, I uh, take over completely in 2007. Um, and, uh, but we still work as a family estate, you know, and as a family, it's, there is not a big change. Only thing is that we're getting older and therefore decisions uh, has to be moved from him to me over the last, uh, uh, 15 years and uh, of course my parents are now happy that they do not have the responsibility for the things but they still help and it's 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 great to have this uh, in a way that generations work together without having hard discussions and it's really working for us nice okay great so a few pictures there yeah, this is a tasting room it's luckily we do not have too many tourists here in the region. Sorry for saying this, but it's of you know it's, it could be a very hard uh, thing to 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 have uh, tastings at, at the estate. So, but we do get a lot of wine professionals coming here uh, for tastings. I would, all, of course, invite everybody who is hearing us at the moment. If you are interested in our wines, just give us a signal, send us a mail. You are welcome, but it's need it's necessary to have an appointment. Yeah, a view in the garden, which is, yeah, my, my father is a, is a, he's also a big gardener. He's, and then this is the same he's doing in the vineyard. So he's, he's, uh, he's also a collector in a way. So he, he's collecting plants and uh, he moved from the idea having Mediterranean plants in our garden into the idea having more tropical plants in the garden. And it's, everything is working here because the Rhine Valley is climate wise, uh, uh, very nice for, for, for doing this. Was it, was it your father, Gunter, who was really the driving force behind um, the conversion to organic viticulture and then the conversion to biodynamic? Yeah, you, you're 100% right that he, he was the responsible man for going into the movement to being organic um, because he thought a lot about these doings and these uh, crazy 
development into industrial farming, which has uh, uh, going on extremely from the 60s to the 80s. And um, so um, there was the thinking about what will happen with our soils and what, what, what will be with the next generation? Will the soil stay healthy for a long time? And uh, this is, you know, as a, as a, it's family business. And, and our, our most important thing we do have is our soil, our vineyards, our land, our, and, and, and uh, we have to protect uh, this. Uh, and uh, so that was, this was um, the main idea why he changed into a, going into organics because he believed it's, it could be not the right way to, to, to do this industrial farming, which is going, coming more and more in the 60s and 70s. And of course, there was another point, and this was the quality question. Um, that we, we have produced fine wines since a long time. And if you are working on fine wines, if you do think about quality intensely, you do think about the plants, the wines, the question how deep the roots are going down into earth, uh, the question about be be growing balance in the vineyard. The idea is to get perfect fruits. And through this, thinking about these uh, uh, points, you come more and more to the idea that the quality should be better as more natural it's going on and as less you, you, you do give influence to, to, to it. And uh, we have learned in these, when we uh, got the first influences of climate change, which is unfortunately really existing also here, um, that biodynamic farming could help you enormously to find a new growing balance in the vineyard. And uh, we, we, we have worked on biodynamics for a time, but after this crazy year 2003, this hot vintage 2003, with these high alcohol levels, low acidity levels, and very different uh, wine style we, we also got in Germany, we decided to go 100% into biodynamics to bring the vineyards back into a better growing balance that they could uh, come better come better through these uh, intense extreme parts if it's rain or if it's heat uh, it's difficult for the plant and biodynamics is helping to find a better balance actually are there just a quick question on that are in in Vestofen, are there any other producers who are practicing uh, biodynamics or is it basically no, it's, it's luckily it's, it's developed nice uh, in the last years. Of course, first I have to say there is a lot of organic growers in, in my region. And uh, of course, one of the reasons is because uh, it's because why it's, it's working here because climate conditions are good for this. And we also do see that interest into biodynamics is growing enormously. And of course, if, when, when neighbors have seen that there is something happening in our vineyards, they thought about it. And so, of course, yes, there are a few others also uh, um, going into this direction. And uh, some of them are also certified as biodynamics. And there's also a good uh, uh, exchange between uh, uh, the estates. And we discuss a lot about our doings. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's, 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 in some parts, it's really teamwork, which feels quite well. Excellent. Yeah, here we do have a view on our uh, Moorstein vineyards, which are the most uh, famous one. It's a uh, um, south-faced hillside um, situated on 200, 220 meters uh, attitude um, and of course planted with Riesling. Another view to the vineyards of Westhoven from the si side of Kirschspiel, um, also south-faced, some parts are east-faced. Um, yeah, and yeah, this uh, amazing fruits from the last vintage. Uh, we do like healthy fruits. We, we hate botrytis. We, I, I do not like this. I would like to have a very clear and pure uh, aromatic and texture. And therefore we select everything out, which is not nice enough for us. We would like to have healthy and crisp uh, fruit texture. Of course, therefore everything is picked by hand. As you see on this uh, picture is also produced in the Moorstein. Um, it's, it's intense handwork uh, for getting these perfect quality. 
one you, thing rest one, in the house just yeah. really quick so one thing that you focus on i think too is sort of the the manual labor uh in the vineyard and and you talk about uh selective hand harvesting um mm. can you ex just explain a little bit what that is yeah so if you if you pick the fruits by hand you do see every bunch in your hand before you cut it and if you do not have only healthy berries you just have to say okay i would not like this berry this berry and this berry and you put it out and this at the, 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 the result should be what you see on this picture that there are only healthy fruits and because of the situation that in the vineyard when you are standing all day long cutting a bunch you can't get everything perfect therefore we do have a second place at home we do have a sorting table where we check the fruits again and, and then we, and then you do multiple passes through the vineyard is that correct that's also correct we also do this but it's very much depending on the vintage you know in some vintage we do see a ripeness development which is going straightly on and then you say okay now is the right point and we take everything other years are more uh, 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 different and you say let's take just the, the the yellow fruits and wait for the other ones which are still a little bit green or you could say let's take all the botrytis out um, and wait for the others so a lot of different possibilities and uh, it could be in in a vintage that we have three four five movements through a vineyard but i prefer it just to have two a pre-selection and the and the main selection this is the most perfect way for me because then I get it as I want to have it and it's not a difficult year and so uh, what I want to say is every vintage is different and we do like this difference it's a typical thing of wine growings uh, in the traditional European countries it's climate conditions therefore we do have different texture of the vintage and we do like the fingerprint of the vintage but we would like to get also the fingerprint of us into the wine style. So therefore, there is the influence of us uh, as, a, as a wine grower. Got it. Yeah, the pressing house. So um, we do work now. In, we, it's, it's a picture from, from last year. Now I, I, I got a third press because for me the press is really something like a music instrument. You could play a lot of different uh, things on it and uh, it's important to take the decision how to pick, how, 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 to, how to crush or how to store on, 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 on skins or not and on what timing and how to press. It's very important and, that it, and it means I'm the only one together with my cellar master, so two people who are allowed to, to push the button for starting the press because we first have to decide how we have to do it. It's a very important thing. So what I want to say is our season is something very special where we do get a lot of interest into the style of our wines. Do you work with the very long press cycles? So um, we, we, we do it quite different. So depending on the healthiness of the fruits, of the, the, the uh, skin six and uh, it's um, let's say let's say I prefer to have long pressing times without having any rotations very gentle and careful but long this is the perfect uh, uh, way for me but sometimes I have to change it into a, going a little bit quicker through it because it's very very rich and, and and ripe or i don't know so um it's very much depending on the fruits got it understood yeah let's have a view into the wine cellar this uh, cellar is built in 1829 so it's uh, um, the main oldest part of the estate and still uh, the heart of the estate it's a perfect climate condition down there and this cellar is the reason why i have decided let's say 10 years ago not to grow in quantity anymore because I would like to stay on this traditional focus 
working in this cellar, working with big uh, wooden cars in the classical traditional way and not building new buildings, producing more quantities, uh, I don't know. Of course, you could do everything perfectly exact, but it would change the characteristic of your, of your uh, estate. And I personally love this idea of being a boutique winery, producing very uh, special things. And I also do have the idea, I would like to give this estate into the hands of my children uh, in long terms. And I personally think it's easier for them if it's not a big, big thing, which is difficult to handle. Of course, they have to decide if they would go on or not. I would really love that they will go on, but I do not know, of course. But I, I will not bring them in the, into the situation that it's a lot of pressure to them. And so therefore, I like the idea being being a, a farmer in a way. We are not, we are not uh, uh, a big company uh, who is uh, going crazy for earning money. We are farmers in, in, in our uh, countryside. Yeah, and the wooden casts are very much, uh, are very important for, for the style of our wine. So you get the micro-oxidation uh, between the fermentation. Of course, everything is fermenting naturally. Uh, so we do not add any commercial yeasts. Um, this is important also, this is also important for the style. Um, and uh, so we do have fermentation times of around 30, 40 days. All the wines are fermenting totally through. So the wines are bone dry, mainly below three grams of residual sugar. Exception are some Spätlese or Auslese wines, but it's only 3% of the, of the quantity which is produced in this way. So the main part and the most important part is, is the dry style. Yeah, this is uh, the, 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 the seller for the Pinot Noir. Of course, we are working with pieces uh, for, uh, for the Pinot. And we do believe that uh, a very careful and gentle handling is very important for the Pinot Noir. It's a very sensible variety, same as Riesling, as white wine. Um, and we do see there is more and more interest in our German Pinots because of the climate change, maybe, in a way. You get very nice, cool, driven fruit aromatics. You, we have these chalky soils, which are amazing for, for, for Pinot too. And so we are very happy uh, uh, and, um, uh, to, 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 to go on in, the, in this way. It's very interesting. And even, and even Robert Parker <laughs> said that we got those 90 points for the Pinot Noir, for the estate Pinot Noir, what you carry as well in California. Yeah, this is so it's, entry, it's our entry level and therefore it's a nice uh, result, I guess. And uh, yeah. You know, what I, what I love about your Spätburgunder, your Pinot Noir, is that it, it really, um, I feel like, I like to think anyway, if I tasted it blind, that I might think that it's German. Um, it, it's a great example, but it still, I think, shows its terroir, um, which is, uh, I think, is a testament to what you've been doing there. Thank you for this, because, of course, this is our goal to, 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 to follow this idea. And just back on your cellar there, um, those larger casks on the side, on the side those are uh, 25 hectoliter? So uh, in the back, this uh, is a 3,000 liter size. In the middle, it's 1,200. And okay. in directly in front, uh, on the right side, it's 2,400 liter. And these three sizes are the main size, 1,200, 2,400, and 3,000. But there are also some existing with 6,000 liter and 600 liter. See, but these are the more extreme ones. So the main size is 2,400 to 3,000. And what is the depth of the cellar there? It's seven meters down into the earth. Seven meters. And then so you yeah. press off up in the press room that you showed us, and then what happens then? Yeah, do we, 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 we do uh, bring the juice down into the cellar uh, um, by gravity and uh, um, it's uh, fermenting naturally in the, in the big wooden casks, um, intense control, but without any doings on it. Uh, then we, we, we sulfur quite gentle and careful to keep it stable because we would like to avoid malolactic fermentations. We would, we like, we look for the crispness, for the freshness 
um, especially with the Rieslings. And then we store it on the lease for a long time. Um, the estate uh, qualities, the basement qualities are bottled in, in spring and the top wines are bottled shortly before the next uh, harvest season is coming. I see. So basically the wine is, the, the, the grapes come in, they're pressed off, they go down into the cellar seven meters down and then they ferment and they age there in those large fooder. Uh, exactly. Without any movement, it's staying exactly. on the same uh, lease all the time. And then just prior, then it's just moved at bottling. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, here we do see the map of Westhoven vineyards. All uh, uh, the colored uh, part is vineyards. Um, the gray colored part is the Premier Cru level and the dark blue colored part are the four different Concrete sizes. So we do have a, a, a classification which is um, uh, done by the VDP, a private classification system. The VDP is a, the association of the German fine wine growers and it's uh, four steps in the classification. It's a VDP Gutswein or estate wine, uh, which is named by the estate, by the variety and by the region. Then we do have the village wine, the VDP Ortswein, which is named by the village. Um, uh, and uh, um, of course, it's a selection of fruits coming from, from the very good vineyards of, 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 the, of the village. Then we do have the Aste Lage, and in our uh, region in the Rhein-Hessen, there is a specialty on this because we have decided to use our village names in combination with the uh, Aste Lage as pre uh, with Premier Cru naming. Uh, comparable to wines like a Bone Premier Cru or a Jean Bon Musigny Premier Cru, because otherwise we do have to bring another 50 to 100 uh, vineyard site names onto the map, and everybody would be confused. Through our uh, um, geological situations, it's mainly bigger parts which are comparable. And so we could do a classification where we do have in the Astelag, in the Premier Crew level, the spots which reflect uh, the terroir of the, of the village in the best possible way. And therefore, our mo most important uh, wine on this uh, stage is Westhofen Riesling, named by the village Westhofen, but it's a Premier Crew. Fruits are coming only from the top sides of Moorstein and Brunnenhäuschen. And of course, on the top, we do have the VDP Große Lager. The dry style is called GG, the Großes Gewächs. The fruity style and noble sweet style is called, uh, with a predicate like cabinet, spät laser, aus laser, etc. So let me just uh, clarify here really quick. So the, the, the Gutswein is what would be the estate Riesling. Exactly. Right? And then the Ortswein it is not existing at the moment as not. Riesling. It's just existing as Silvana and as Pinot Blanc. So yeah. it's, uh, so it's uh, not, we do not produce village wine or Orts wine with Riesling. We just do it with other varieties. Got it. Understood. And on the, on the Astelager, then we do have three different ones. It's Gundersheim, Westhofen, and the famous village of Nierstein as Premier Cru. Got it, got it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, picture of the different wines we produce. And uh, yeah, maybe Matthias could uh, uh, tell you something about the three most important wines, uh, I think also in the American market or in the California market. And let me just, Matthias, just before you jump in here, uh, Philip, so I had a question from David Jackson, who is um, our uh, sales manager in the San Diego and Orange County area. And he had asked, has your family always focused on dry wines? Definitely, yes. So the, the oldest uh, one we still store is from the vintage 1921. I've tasted it three times, I guess, or four times. And it's a dry Moorstein. And it's, it's really the tradition of, of, of the region. Of course, uh, these 
Spätlese and Auslese wines are something special because quantities have been always lower than uh, the quantities for the dry style where you could use the healthy fruits. But it's from the climate conditions uh, side and from the idea and region, it's dry wine we have produced all the time, yes. Okay, great. And then another quick question before uh, I move on to you, Matthias. So Kelvin DeBoer, who is, um, he's actually our manager um, on the peninsula, so near kind of Palo Alto and San Jose area. He's asking if um, the Vesthofen wines um, from, uh, are all estate-owned vineyards that you produce. Yes. Definitely. So all the wines which, which to take the eagle on the cap and to have these uh, label with the, with the stripes, it's always produced from family-owned vineyards. It's not rented vineyards, it's not contract partner vineyards, it's family-owned and produced by our own stuff uh, uh, um, uh, for everything. Got it. Perfect. All right, Matthias, I'll, I'll let you move on now. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, as Philip said, I mean, you guys know that we're doing 75% Riesling. So Riesling is, is definitely our, our main focus. And I think that's, that's what we're famous for. And, and, and especially those three Rieslings we're going to show you now. This is now all, as well, the press reviews on the 2018. We do have the, the famous estate Riesling, uh, which is still our most important wine on the estate. Because we do think that the quality-wise, we're trying to get the people... Um, especially because this wine is mostly uh, for wine by the glass and, and wine pairings in, in, in good restaurants. It's, it's for us, it's super important to get the people and say like, oh, wow, this is the estate we're seeing. Let's try something else as well. So for us, quality wise, even on the estate level, um, this is something where we really want to get the people and say like, oh, wow, this is a great quality. And this is the estate Riesling is about two thirds fermented in big oak casts and one third is stainless steel. Um, and this is just a great ambassador of the limestone Rieslings what we have in Rheinhessen, especially here in the southern part of, of, uh, of Rheinhessen in the so-called Wonnegau part. Um, and then we were talking and the question was about the Westhofener Riesling as well. Um, this is still about the 2018 Westhofener Riesling. Now on the pre-sale, it's, it's all 2019, I know. Uh, we just bottled the Westhofener. Um, we're gonna bottle it tomorrow. So uh, it's a, a, yeah exciting time as well for us. And as Westhofner Riesling, you need to keep in mind that those premier cru levels, especially for the Westhofen, is only sourced from Moorstein and Brunnenhäuschen vineyards. So it's sourced from 100% Grand Cru stuff, but our selection of what goes into Westhofen and what goes into Moorstein and, and Brunnenhäuschen is really strict. And we're really lucky that the Westhofen is an absolutely um, high-class Promacru wine, which is fermented in 100% big oak casts. And it really shows the, the saltiness and the length and the, and the depth and the, and the yeah, complexity of, of the uh, limestone soils, what the, what the hillside of, of Westhofen is famous about. So um, just a quick question. So that, that wine, do you f find that that's a, a, a great representation of the terroir of Westhofen? Like, if I taste this wine, you know, versus another village um, in, uh, I know it's not a village level wine, but does it represent the village? If I were to taste another village uh, inside the Rheinhessen, would I definitely taste the difference? This is definitely have a Vestofen signature on it. 100% yes. Yeah. So can you tell me what is the signature of Vestofen? I think maybe Philip can explain it a little bit better because... <laughs> yeah, let's say we do talk about three important things. First, it's climate conditions, which are interesting because you do have enough warmness over the year that everything is growing quite nicely. Not a lot of rain but enough for coming through and uh, um, uh, a lot of sun over the vegetation period, which is helping the plants uh, for producing ripe fruits, which is very important. Secondly, we do talk about the soils, which are 
unique in the way that you, we do have these big rocky underground. So these big rocks in the underground, it's really, it's, it's limestone and it's, uh, it's uh, a very special material. And uh, um, on the top soil, we do have clay, marl clay, also some limestone material, for sure, very chalky texture. Um, and this clayish topsoils do preserve the water in a very well way. So we come through the vegetation time also without a lot of rain, but we keep uh, healthy fruits over this. And this combination of these, on the one side, cool climate conditions, on the other side, uh, um, rich enough uh, conditions for getting ripe, ripe fruits year by year, and together with this uh, texture of, 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 of uh, clay and, 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 and chalk um, is giving a very unique uh, aromatic into the wine. And the third point is that um, the Rhine Valley, where we are in the more southern part, close to the Pfalz region, uh, do has its own rules, own rules about uh, um, also the, the, the climate movement, the growing of the plants. It's, it's, it's a perfect place uh, for, for, for planting wine, uh, wines. And uh, the Romans has decided this uh, uh, more than 2000 years ago that it makes sense to, to, to produce wine in the Rhine Valley. And uh, Westhofen is one of the hot spots of the southern part of Rhine Hessen to produce wine and this makes it special too. So, Philip, in the glass, like if, if, if I were to taste a Westhofen wine, what would be the, the typicity what I, in the glass? What would be, this is it's, a characteristic of that. Yellow, yellow stone fruit driven aromatics. Yep. It's uh, um, always uh, uh, a an, an very dancing uh, acidity, a very juicy acidity. Uh, and it's... Uh, let's say a salty length, a salty aftertaste, uh, which is refreshing the palate in a very well way and you would like to get the next uh, um, glass of it. Wow, okay, <laughs> that's great, thank you. All right, um, talking about the next glass, I think Morstein <laughs> as a Grand Cru is something uh, everybody wants to have a second glass of. Um, and as explained earlier, this is our yeah, most important and, and really, I think, yeah, the Grand Cru site, which everybody knows really, really well. And uh, Philip explained it really beautifully um, at the beginning of the presentation as well, that Westhofen as a village does have vineyards from down to nine, 90 meters elevation up to 240 meters of elevation. And, Morshen is so special because it's really on, yeah, almost on top of the hill. So it's a, compared to other sites in Westhofen, quite a yeah, cool climate site of Westhofen. And on the other hand, um, it is really driven by limestone rocks. So the topsoil is always, as Philip said, a little bit more clay, schmal and loamy soils, but then it's pure rocky limestone underground. And as well, and this is why this picture looks so green and the, and the vineyards look so great, that you do have sources in the underground as well. So we never kind of run out of water and for sure you need water um, that the, the roots are well trained and, and the vines are well trained and you get the nutrition from the ground to the, to the, to the berries and the, and the batches as well. So Morstein as a south-faced vineyard is something, yeah, really quite, quite unique and really interesting terroir as itself and the wine, um, as well as, as Westhofen, is made in 100% big oak casts. So, uh, but you need to keep in mind that we're never using new oak for our Rieslings. It's always old oak, so maybe sometimes even 50 years old, because we don't want the oak for this kind of an oakiness or vanilla toast. We want that for the micro-oxidation and the texture of the wines. So this is something super important for us that we're using the oak, because we do think that there's no better material for high class reasons to age them on the leaves and during fermentation as well. And yeah, maybe Philip, you can explain a little bit more what, what, why Morstein is for you and for us the top concrete, what we're doing. No, no, <laughs> no words needed anymore. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's, it's also my personal favorite in, in our uh, collection year by year. It's a special vineyard. It's, it's this combination of uh, having cool climate conditions and 
having extreme uh, uh, material in the underground. And uh, of course, what you have to know is this wine needs age for showing what it what it can. So please never taste the youngest. Uh, Please wait a time or do it decanted for a long time. It needs air for showing what it can. And so um, it's, I would, at the moment, I would uh, um, say vintage like 10, 11, 12, 13 are amazing just to open and drink. You could decant it, but it's not neat. 14 is to be decanted for minimum a half hour to an hour. Um, 15 is the same. 16 is still the very, 16, 17 are very young. No need to decant if you want to drink a very young wine. Then it's a, a very aromatic and nice, but it's not what it means being a big wine in long terms. Um, and 18 is not possible to drink at the moment, it's too young. You know, uh, Philip, I'll tell you that um, uh, Suzanne Chambers, the, our president and, and owner of Chambers and Chambers, I was. I told her uh, last week we had 20 cases left. She said, "I want a case." Our VP of of sales and marketing, Ed Hogan, he wanted a case. Scott Stewart, director of sales, he's got a case. I have a case held for me. So um, we're we're completely. We have some stock, but it's completely accounted for. Um, and this is just really, um, really one of the the best white wines uh, in our entire portfolio. It's just a pleasure to represent this wine. Thank you very much for this. Yeah. Yeah, I think this was a presentation of our whole doings. Of course, we are available for more questions. Let me just, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. So on Morstein and let's take like Kirschpiel, for example, in the glass, how do those two wines how would you compare those two wines in the glass? Let's yeah, say that, they, they were ready to drink. Um, it's, it, it's interesting because Kirschpil is different in aromatics. Yeah. It's never these extreme stone fruit, yellow arom, fruit driven, yellow fruit aromatics. It's more green or spicy, uh, um, uh, the Kirschpil. It's a, you know, it's the east faced side. You get the early morning sun, you, but you never get the evening sun on the fruits. And this means, means the, the, the nights are cooler. And uh, so the Kirschpil wines are mostly coming from these spicy aromatics. In some years, it's more things like white pepper, peppermint, uh, these things. And uh, um, then that's, that's, that's the impression of the aromatics. And then you get a very strong mineral length, but in a more charming way as in Morstein. Morstein could be a little bit harder when it's young. Yeah, but in, long, okay. but in long terms, it's a bigger wine. You know, it was funny when I was working with uh, Matthias last year, we had the Morstein and we had the Kirschpiel. We were showing those among, amongst other wines. And the Kirschpiel was definitely younger. It was a little bit easier to, to appreciate. And the yep. Morstein was just a little bit more closed and sort of steely. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I have a question from Dave Rep. Dave Rep is a um, longtime sales representative of Chamber and Chambers in Sonoma, so certainly in our wine country. Um, and he was asking, he said, you know, the, uh, because of your region's historical production of dry wines, do you feel an advantage over other wine producing regions within Germany who have embraced dry styles in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, so do you think there's any, since you've been making dry wines for a long time, is, is there any sort of advantage over maybe some other areas, say in the Mosul, where you know 20 years ago they weren't making dry wines and now they're making dry wines today? Yeah, to, to be honest, uh, we do also feel the climate change in Germany and we do see that uh, things are getting different and no question if you have a view back uh, it would be hard to produce a dry Riesling at Mosul Valley in the 80s or in the 70s uh, or not talking about the 60s um, because fruits are getting not ripe enough to produce this in a serious way but nowadays you could produce amazing dry Riesling that's Mosul Valley too 
it's uh, it's uh, um, possible nowadays, and it's it's a difference to the old days. And also here, even if we have the tradition for producing dry styles, the quality has developed uh, enormously in the last uh, 20 years. And of course, we nowadays have to be careful and have to fight sometimes again warm vintage and we are looking for solutions in long terms uh, because we know that for the moment we are in a perfect situation because everything is, is getting in a perfect balance but we also know it could change into a worse thing uh, in long term so of course we could climb up on the hillside but there will be an end and of course we could give shadow on the fruits in summertime and all these things or we could have irrigation which we don't need luckily yet um, but um, yeah, there is things, uh, things are changing and uh, regions which have been famous for uh, classical, well-balanced, sweeter styles are moving into a more off-dry and dry style, like the Mosul, like the Nile Valley, for example, which is also getting famous for dry style nowadays. Uh, and so um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see this. Um, and uh, we do respect this in 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 a in a uh, uh, intense way, and we are quite lucky that we think we will have the chance to keep on our variety in long terms. I believe that we are able to produce racing in long terms in this style because of our po possibilities we do have here uh, at our place. And I have visited, uh, for example, Australia and Washington State also to see what other people are doing with Riesling in warmer climate conditions. And it's quite interesting to learn about these things. So, so um, I love this variety and I would like to follow the, uh, the tradition, but I know that things have changed. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, so Ryan O'Malley, who is uh, a sales manager of ours in the Los Angeles area, this kind of goes back to the very beginning of, of the presentation. We were talking about how, you know, you're, you're, uh, you've been growing grapes there in the Rheinhessen for 350 years. He was asking, which is the oldest um, producer in the Rheinhessen? Um, and where does Wittmann fall in the ranking of, of longevity, as long, in the ranking of sort of oldest to youngest producers? Is Wittmann the oldest or are there older ones? Um, so unfortunately, I can't give you a precise answer to this. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, we are definitely not the oldest one. Of course, these, these, these very traditional old castles which are existing uh, are mainly uh, producing wines longer than, 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 than we. We are just uh, wine producing uh, farmers in a village, you know. But uh, it's a lot of families who have a long tradition in wine. But for us, what, what, what I personally think it, our situation is special in the way that we are focused on quality for a long time. Got it. Got it. Um, so Scott Stewart, um, whom you may know, he is now the director of sales for Northern California. Back when you came to California, Philip, he was uh, probably in my position. Um, he asks, how would you describe the shift in flavor profile from a young bottle of Morstein to one with the appropriate amount of age? Well, so interesting. Of course, in the beginning, we do talk about these yellow fruit aromatics, these stone fruit uh, characteristics, which are quite strong in the beginning. You always have these salty finish, but you could feel maybe in a young motion, it could feel hard sometimes because it's very strong. Um, and so it could feel some, sometimes a little bit tanninic in a way, maybe. Yeah. And this is the first three years. Vintage by vintage different, some nicer, some more charming, some less. And then we come into the most difficult part of the development of this wine. I would say for all of our wines, it's, it's, it's like this. When you do have on the one side, these young aromatics, and on the other side, the first beginning of uh, um, ripening elements, um, this doesn't match together. It's a, it's a very difficult time for the wines. You could feel first hints of petrolics or something like this, which is something very worse for me. 
on the one side and on the other side you have also still uh, stone fruit aromatics in combination the length is fine it's always the same but the aromatics are difficult working together and this is the most difficult time in warm vintage this is coming earlier after two or three years in cool vintage it could happen that it's just starting after four or five years uh, and it's a time which needs around a year and then this is blown away and the secondary aromatics are getting stronger and will win the game always and then you get you get a lot of different and diverse aromatics fruit flavors from the yellow part into the spicy part uh, and you get these mineral uh, mouth feeling very intensely so uh, taste like spring water of course wow. then they age more and more and when the wines are older than seven eight nine years of course you also get some grateful uh, um, older ar ar aromatics um, and this is keeping in this texture for a long long time so you could drink Morstein, believe me longer than 50 years but the hardest time is between when the wines are very young and start to open and so this and it could mean sometimes for example if you would open a vintage 15 at the moment just directly plop in the glass maybe not so nice but prom uh, but i would promise you give him time in the decanter and you will see it's showing a uh, uh, marvelous aromatics wow okay you know um just curious so uh, who are the largest holders of morstein vineyard we vitman's the the largest yeah yeah it's uh, we we do own more than eight hectares of morstein and this is bringing us in this crazy situation that our best wine is also the wine where we produce most of it from the concourse mm. and maybe this is a, a lucky position in the way that we have more wine available and it also means that it's not getting too expensive um, but it also helps us for having this quality because we could select enormously so Keller also makes a Morstein, is that correct? Yeah, and, uh, amazing ones, really amazing ones. But it's, I, I would say it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, 30% 30, 30 of, of our size in Morstein. I see. Wow. Amazing. Um, so I have a question from Mark Curtis. Um, he's, a, he's a sales manager in the East Bay. So um, Berkeley, um, or Sacramento, and, and, and Oakland. And, and Marin as well. He, he asks, um, Ernie Lozen has maintained, um, has maintained that growing organically in the Mosul area is crazy. Um, given your family's dedication to organic and biodynamic, does your sister grow organically? That's, no, that's your wife. My wife, <laughs> it's my wife, it's my wife. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm just reading it. Is, does, does, does Ava's uh, family, are they organic in the no. Mosul? Ernie, Ernie is right, it's, it's hard. And especially yeah. with our situation, living here, uh, uh, and Eva has to, has to drive to Mosul two, three times a, a week, uh, and you have to control your vineyards intensely if you're going to, into organics. Um, we are not certified yet for Eva's wines, but it's on our uh, um, tablet, we will, we, we will go to this point any day. But it's difficult, these very steep slopes um, and also climate conditions are a little bit more difficult. You have more, more, uh, um, what's this? more higher, um, um, it, it's, it's more, more, more water in the air uh, through the valley situation. Uh, um, and uh, so diseases are coming easier uh, into the, the vineyards. So it's, it's difficult, but it's possible. Got it. Okay. Um, so Felipe Silva, who's a, who's a sales representative in the East Bay, he works for Mark. You know, he's saying, you know, Wittmann is considered to be, you know, uh, the leading producer from the Rheinhessen. Um, and then he just asked, can you name, you know, one or two producers slash neighbors who you admire and consider to be good ambassadors for the region? Of course, uh, 
number one in the region, I would say it's Keller because he's uh, getting the most famous uh, story uh, to its doings. And I also say I, I really like the wines, the amazing wines. And uh, uh, so um, very, very interesting uh, estate. Um, then I would say uh, it's uh, Gunderloch in Nackenheim, which is an amazing estate. Um, it's uh, in the northeastern part, northwestern part. It's Wagner Stempel, which is producing amazing wines on on, on different levels. Um, it's uh, of course uh, also Kühling Gilot Battenfeld Spanier, which is Nierstein and southern part of Rheinhessen. So two estates in one. Um, it's some younger estates which are producing serious qualities too. Uh, you, I could name a few ones. Um, but uh, I personally uh, would say um, that Rheinhessen is still going on in quality and it's every year another new name on the map. Got it. In Westhofen, um, Keller is located in Westhofen, correct? Oh, no, he's, he's located in the neighbor village in Flörsheim and Alzheim. Oh, okay. But his All wife right. is coming from Westhofen. Got it, okay. Um, you know, one just quick thing that I wanted to just briefly touch on, um, you know, in our portfolio, um, I mean, you're, the, the reasons are obviously the core, they're the flagship. Um, but in, in our portfolio, the Sylvaner and the Shoy Rebbe are really unique wines. The, they're the only wines that we sell, the only, you know, in our German portfolio. Uh, is, Shoy Rebbe is the only one that we have. Um, in our entire book. Um, and I know that they're really minor. Um, for us, they're maybe a little bit more major than, than what they represent in your, port, in your entire production. Um, but can you talk about these varieties? It's, I think it's interesting how you've kept them alive and they make these really fun, aromatic wines that drink well young. Yeah, Silvana is the most traditional variety of Rheinessen. Uh, and uh, so there is a big tradition for this variety and of course therefore we still uh, um, grow it uh, or let it grow and uh, um, it's uh, a wine which is very nice balanced in uh, acidity and creaminess so it's a little bit lighter and a little bit more creamy and uh, um, uh, um, very useful for the daily dish um, a very nice variety for, for, for the wine by, for every day. Um, and we do, like, we do like this variety very much for this entry level. Um, and the Scheurebe is something special. It's these aromatics of Scheurebe are very much comparable with Sauvignon Blanc, but not as loud as Sauvignon Blanc is. So, they, so it's a little bit uh, calmer, a little bit more elegant in these aromatics. And to show, to show the, the, these uh, um, limestone-driven texture in a nice way. So therefore, I like the variety. It's only two vineyards we have uh, planted with Scheurebe. It's a specialty and a little bit of playing ground. And uh, yeah, we, 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 do, we do like to, to have these uh, uh, varieties. But of course, it's, uh, as you could imagine, for us, it's more playing ground. Uh, which is also uh, reflecting our terrain in a nice way, but the focus is very much on Riesling and the Burgundy family. Of course, yeah. So um, I just have a couple quick questions and then I think we'll wrap things up. Um, Brant Osinich, who is um, a sales representative in San Francisco, he asks, um, what's the biggest or most unique challenge to farming in the Rheinhessen? If there are none, you know, that's fine too. <laughs> I would say, um, as everywhere, it's the nature, conditions, and the weather. Got it. Just, you know, when, when you study about wine, uh, one of the areas that we'll study is Alsace, and they'll talk about how Alsace is very dry because the Vosges Mountains are kind of like a rain shadow. So the Alsatian producer can just pick when they want to harvest, right? It's it's because it's fairly dry. Um, is it is that the same in in Vestofen? Are you or do climactic conditions really sort of during harvest 
uh, affect your timing of when you're picking? Um, I would say Alsace is a little bit uh, southern of us. Let's say it's 100 kilometers southern of us, 100, 120 kilometers. And it's a little bit warmer there. And of yeah. course, they do have also these steep slopes with uh, um, uh, yeah, very uh, intense uh, um, stone underground, stony underground. And this means that sometimes also there is not a lot of water uh, in the underground. And this is the difference. We do have a lot of water in the underground because um, our, our vineyards are planted on a south phase part going to a south, uh, east phase part which is uh, um, getting the water from, from uh, an area of 20 kilometers, which are on the top level. And so the water is coming uh, uh, down through and going into our vineyards. So we do have really sources in our vineyards. And this is helpful uh, for coming through these uh, um, um, hot summers. And I guess in, in Alsace, it's maybe more dry than here. Got it. But do you, does the, is the, are the weather conditions in, is, is rain, for example, a factor for you as to when you're picking your grapes and, and usually not, not, usually not. Okay. So this is the last question. This comes from Ann Miller. She is a, um, a sales representative in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills and some other um, cities there. She asks, um, who is the portrait on the wall behind you? Who is in that portrait? It's my uncle. He has uh, been a, a um, collector, an art collector, lived in Berlin. And so um, uh, he has influenced the family uh, in uh, art questions intensely. And this was a portrait of him produced uh, in the end of the 80s. So um, wow. he's, for example, he, he, he has also, uh, for example, uh, known Keith Herring very well. Uh, so he was uh, um, uh, in the 80s very much interested in modern art. Got it. Excellent. Well, um, I wanted to thank you both for taking the time to, to do this webinar today. I think that uh, I think we covered all the bases, and I know that I certainly have a better understanding of, of your estate and Vestofen and the amazing Grand Cru vineyards like Morstein that, that, that you make. So thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Um, it really is a pleasure in California to represent your wines. Um, I hope to keep working with them and promoting them and growing them in the state. We have to thank you. For us, it's a, it's a pleasure to have this, uh, you as a great partner in California. And uh, for us, it's uh, um, the, the, the state where we have an intense focus on. And uh, I promise you, we will support you as good as we can. And hopefully, we also could travel again uh, to California, Matthias and also me. And uh, let's hope that we next time maybe see us in real. Sounds perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. All right. Take All care. Right. Bye bye. -bye. bye, -bye.